welcome all those participants uh, who have joined our meeting today. This has been called by the Socialist Equality Party and it is the final uh, meeting, the final election meeting uh, of our campaign because obviously the uh, election will take place next Saturday. Uh, my name is Cheryl Crisp and I'll be chairing today's meeting. And we do want to, as I said, discuss all the issues which confront millions of ordinary people in this country, but also internationally. Three of our six candidates uh, who are standing in the Senate will address the meeting today. Uh, and the reason that we're not having the six uh, candidates is just literally because of time. Uh, the, but the other three candidates um, will be available in the discussion and question and answer period. Uh, if you have any questions uh, to address to them or they will also assist in the answering. So those who will be uh, presenting remarks and contributions today will be Oscar Grenfell, who is uh, standing in the Senate in New South Wales, Mike Head standing in Queensland and Peter Byrne in Victoria. But I would like to begin with a development which may seem uh, to be somewhat unconnected to the topic of our meeting. On May the 12th, the Event Horizon Telescope collaboration released the imagery of the supermassive black hole at the centre of the Milky Way galaxy, Sagittarius A star. More than 300 astronomers, hundreds of engineers and support staff from 60 institutions across 20 countries and regions on all seven continents made the observations process the data and maintain the technical infrastructure needed for such an immense undertaking. Because Sagittarius A star is 2000 times closer to Earth than M87 star, which is a much larger black hole, but much further away, uh, the Event Horizon Telescope was able to observe both, both black holes at a similar resolution, giving astronomers a chance to learn about the universe by comparing the two. Black holes are the only objects in existence that only answer to one law of nature, and that is gravity. The processing time for the information that the EHT was producing was equivalent to running 2000 laptops at full speed for one year. Now you may ask, is this relevant? And the reason that I raise it is because it demonstrates what is possible through the international collaboration of science, technology, that is human endeavor, which develops man's knowledge of the law governed processes of the, universe, of the universe and enables us to produce a deeper understanding of the world in which we live and the galaxies beyond this one. Xavier Barkins, the Director General of the European Southern Observatory, uh, said in a press conference to announce the findings that this shows what we can achieve when we cooperate, when we work together. As he says, this is very important to remember in the times that we're living in, where the world is not running in that direction, unfortunately. Now, Barkins undoubtedly is referring to the growing crisis of capitalism as expressed in the mounting death toll from the COVID uh, virus, the escalating threat of world war, including the possibility of nuclear war, skyrocketing levels of inflation, food shortages, supply chains, uh, which are plunging billions of people into the threat of hunger, want and disease. So just let us, uh, first of all, briefly examine the experience with the COVID pandemic, uh, which is the result of the SARS-CoV-2 virus, a virus that was predicted and predictable, a virus which science and medicine have determined how to eliminate, but still it rages throughout the world. The World Health Organization last week reported that the official death toll was in fact three times higher, over 15 million dead when calculated on the basis of excess deaths. 
The Economist and The Lancet actually place it at closer to 20 million. This is in the space of a little over two years. The figures now reported by every capitalist government, with the exception of China, bears no relationship to the actual situation. Testing, contact tracing and reporting have all been dispensed with. Not because it wasn't known how to eliminate the virus, but because the resources required to do so were dismissed by these same governments in favour of production and wealth. And in Australia, it is actually especially sharp. Not only was it known how to reduce infections and deaths to zero, but it had been applied, begrudgingly, unwillingly, certainly, but nevertheless instituted. But in December of 2021, that ended through a bipartisan assault on health by the Labor government in Victoria, the Liberals in New South Wales, and the Morrison coalition government. The result, according to global databases uh, this week, Australia now leads the world in per capita COVID infections. If you ignore a couple of very tiny islands like the Falklands. Saturday's numbers move the official seven day average to above 48,000 daily cases putting Australia behind only Germany and the US in total new daily cases recorded. Australia, in Australia, hospitalizations and deaths are also tracking upwards with the average number of COVID related daily deaths hitting 40, double that of March. As we stand today and as we meet, a quarter of the Australian population has been infected with COVID. And again, as I say, that is with the entirely understated and really spurious figures which pass as official. Six and a half million people are infected, have been infected. 7,769 have died. More than five and a half thousand people have lost their lives in the last four and a half months alone twice the number of flu deaths in the past six years. Two plane loads of people are dying each week from COVID and long COVID, which according to overseas data, may affect up to 10% of those who are infected. In January of 2022, COVID was the second most common cause of death ahead of dementia and heart disease. Now this is under conditions in which only 52.5% of Australians have received their booster shot, with the two dose, dose, uh, doses never effective against Omicron, and under conditions where the efficacy of those shots are now waning. Predictions are that this winter we'll see an upsurge of COVID and flu under conditions where there are daily reports of the collapse of the hospital system in every state. The excess deaths cited by the World Health Organization are predominantly the result of the collapse of hospital systems unable to cope. The disaster which is, uh, which is the pandemic is not past, but very much present and future. Has this been the center of the discussion in the election campaign? No. We have described this as a conspiracy of silence by every political party led by the coalition government and Labor. The only party which has highlighted and warned the working class of the immense dangers it confronts with COVID has been the SEP. It didn't feature in the debates. It's not mentioned in the policies of any of the capitalist parties or in most media outlets. Epidemiologists, however, are crying out desperately for change, but to no avail. Just a, a small sample of their comments, Dr. David Berger, who gave crucial testimony to the Global World uh, Workers Inquest, has said, quote, people really need to ask what impact the first widely circulating airborne super antigen will have on human health long-term. There has been no virus like this in recorded history. Dr. Shane Huntington said, 
The Victorian health system has been in trouble for a very long time. COVID has made things worse. Letting COVID rip will do further damage. Extraordinary leadership needed. And as health officials race to understand, uh, this is a by a journalist actually, as health officials race to understand what's causing unexplained hepatitis in children around the world, COVID-19 is, is among the key suspects. So while governments commit unprecedented levels of funding to arm Ukraine in the proxy war against Russia, measures to combat COVID-19 are dispensed with. Now, the relationship between the development of science, as I cited in the, uh, the beginning of my remarks, if the approach which guided the study of Sagittarius A star was adopted to all aspects of society, conscious scientific planning, international collaboration, the allocation of necessary resources that the world needs, it, the world would be a very different place. But that world, uh, in order to reach that, would require the reorganisation of society. It would require the reallocation of society's wealth from the tiny wealthy elite to the, to the mass of the world's population. The appeal to governments, to capitalist parties or unions is a futile and bankrupt perspective. It is only the working class united with science, united with medicine, with technology uh, that can liberate the necessary resources to eliminate COVID, to rid the world of the threat of war and the degradation of the planet through climate change. That means the overthrow of capitalism. And so it is on these issues that we want to address you today. Our uh, three main speakers, who I'm very, very pleased to introduce, will develop many of the aspects uh, that have been central to our election uh, campaign. Uh, they will deal with the questions of war, they will deal with the questions of the class struggle, and of course the, uh, the growing uh, development of attacks against the working class as a whole. Our first speaker is Oscar Grenfell. Oscar is 30, and he is the National Convener of the International Youth and Students for Social Equality. He's a member of the SEP's National Committee and an extensive contributor and correspondent uh, for the World Socialist Web website. And he writes on a range of political and industrial issues, the defence of Julian Assange, uh, the political and social crisis confronting young people, and the exposures of the pro-capitalist policies of the Greens and the pseudo-lefts. Oscar was born and raised in Sydney, uh, and he joined the SEP while at high school. And what uh, attracted Oscar uh, to the program of the, of the Socialist Equality Party and the International Committee uh, was our opposition to war and his enormous concern about the wars that were raging in Iraq and Afghanistan. He was also very interested in politics, but interestingly was not attracted to Labor, the Greens or the pseudo lefts. He was searching for a party that could explain the complex historical questions uh, and place today's issues in a broader context. He has studied at university at the University of Sydney. Um, he majored in English literature. And in 2015, he stood uh, for the SEP uh, in, uh, in Bankstown in New South Wales. He's also stood in Graindler uh, and in Parramatta. And so I am very pleased to introduce Oscar as our first speaker. And I'm sure you will give him a warm welcome. Thanks very much, Comrade Cheryl, and greetings to comrades and friends. At the outset of our campaign, the SEP said that this would be an election like no other. The past decade has been characterised by a deepening crisis, the two-party system. One prime minister and party leader 
after another has been deposed in backroom coups. In each of the last federal elections, the dominant trend has been mass hostility to Labor, the Liberals and the whole parliamentary setup. But we've emphasised that the 2022 election marks a turning point. These processes, the decay of the political establishment and the increasing disaffection and anger of millions of people have reached a qualitative new level. Why is this election different to those before? Above all, it's because of the global situation. Capitalism on a world scale is in its deepest crisis for the past 80 years. All of the questions of the first half of the 20th century, fascism, dictatorship, war and revolution are back on the agenda. Developments in this country have always been an expression of international processes. But in no election in living memory, has the situation in Australia been so immediately and directly determined by global developments of a truly historic character? What are the main features of the international situation? Well, as comrade Cheryl raised in opening, we're in the third year of a global pandemic with no end in sight as a result of the profit-driven and homicidal policies of governments around the world. Officially, more than half a billion people have been infected with COVID-19, and over 6.2 million have perished. But the real figures are many times higher. During the election campaign, the World Health Organization estimated that the coronavirus has claimed at least 15 million lives, a death toll that can only be compared with world war. Other estimates place the lives lost at more than 20 million. The willingness of capitalist governments to inflict these levels of preventable illness and death should lay rest to the argument that they would not risk a nuclear war because of its catastrophic consequences for human life. And that's precisely what they're doing. The election campaign has unfolded under conditions of an active shooting war in Europe involving nuclear armed states, including the US and Russia, as well as all of the major European powers. The conflict in Ukraine flows from the longstanding drive by American capitalism to offset its economic decline through the use of its military might. This project, pursued through 30 years of unending wars in the Middle East, Central Asia, and North Africa, now involves a direct confrontation with Russia and China, which are viewed as the chief obstacles to American imperialist dominance. Every other state is also rapidly remilitarizing, including Germany, which is pursuing the same war aims that played such a horrific role in the two world wars of the 20th century. Over the same period as the election campaign, all claims that this is a regional conflict or one resulting solely from the immediate actions of the Russian state have been refuted. The US has assembled a semi-permanent war council explicitly directed against Russia and hundreds of billions of dollars in military aid have been sent to Ukraine by the US and NATO with 40 billion more uh, introduced by the US Congress just last week. Senior officials of the Biden administration have declared that they're determined to win the war against Russia, while Pentagon strategists are publicly discussing the use of so-called tactical nuclear weapons. We've emphasized the same contradictions of capitalism that are propelling the imperialist powers towards all out war are also providing the impulse for major social struggles. And that's the most significant feature of this year. The working class is re-emerging onto the political scene after decades in which the class struggle has been suppressed, above all by the corporatized trade unions. The first four and a half months of 2022 have witnessed significant strikes on virtually every inhabited continent. To point to only a handful of manifestations of this emerging global movement, there were more than 100 wildcat strikes in Turkey, in the first two months of the year. There's an emerging strike wave in Brazil and other Latin American countries and major struggles of the US working class involving health workers, dock workers, auto workers, and a growing number of other sections. In Sri Lanka, a mass popular movement demanding the ouster of the Rajapaksa government has involved enormous mobilizations of the working class, including general strikes. This movement is international in a very direct sense. It's motivated by the inflation that is affecting workers in literally every country in the world. 
And these price hikes are themselves the result of the major global developments. They stem from the supply chain disruptions caused by the let it rip COVID policies, the massive transfusion of public funds into the financial markets and the disruptive consequences of the Ukraine war. And all of these struggles are raising the most fundamental political questions. That is the need for new organizations of the working class, independent of the unions, which function as a police force of governments and the corporations. And above all, the question of which class will rule society, either the vast mass of working people or a socially destructive and obscenely wealthy capitalist oligarchy. Now these issues of war, the COVID catastrophe and ex increasingly explosive anger in the working class are present in Australia, no less than anywhere else. But the official election campaign on the part of all the parliamentary parties and the media has had the character of a conspiracy of silence. Discussion of all of these major questions has been suppressed. Instead, the population has been bombarded with mudslinging on the part of Labor and the Liberals, banal personality politics, and absurd lies that Australia is on the cusp of an economic boom. This election was prepared through a sweeping attack on so-called minor parties aimed at blocking working people from hearing any alternative to the establishment parties. Last August, Labor and the coalition came together to pass electoral laws whose purpose was to clear the ballot ahead of this election. The legislation tripled the number of members that a party without parliamentary representation required to be registered. Concretely, the laws demanded that we get 1,000 additional members under conditions of raging COVID infections and safety restrictions in the space of less than three months. As a consequence, the SEP and at least 12 other parties were deregistered, meaning that our party name uh, does not appear on the ballot. The coming together of Labor and the coalition to pass these laws summed up the real political situation. Behind the insults and theatrics between Albanese and Morrison, Labor and the Liberals agree on all of the substantive questions. The issue of COVID has scarcely even been mentioned in the official campaign. This under conditions of more than 50,000 infections a day and some 250 deaths over the past five days alone. Labor and the coalition, which presided over the disastrous lifting of all safety measures in December, are committed that there will never be a return to lockdowns or even limited restrictions. The economy must remain open so that profits are made, whatever the consequence in illness and death. On war, both of the major parties are marching in lockstep with the Biden administration. They've dispatched more than $150 million in military aid to Ukraine to be used directly against Russia. In this region, they're both fully committed to the US confrontation with China, including the establishment of AUKUS last September, a military pact that the US, Britain and Australia explicitly aimed at preparing for war in the Asia Pacific. On climate change, Labor has joined the Liberals in declaring support for the opening of new coal mines. In other words, not even a pretense of addressing this existential threat facing humanity. On refugees, Albanese has insisted, there's not a, not a slither of difference between the parties. Both would illegally turn back refugee boats on the high seas and imprison asylum seekers in the concentration camps of the Pacific. And above all, on the major social questions, Labor and the coalition are hardly offering a pittance to working people, but they're both committed to the stage three tax cuts for the wealthy and other handouts for big business. Labor has pledged virtually nothing to healthcare or education, and it's ruled out any increase to the sub-poverty uh, level unemployment allowance. Amid a soaring cost of living, Labor won't even make a verbal commitment to lifting the minimum wage to match the current understated rate of inflation. We've noted that there are really two election campaigns. On the one hand, there's the rubbish and the diversion that's being served up to the population. And on the other, there's a shadow campaign in which Labor and the Liberals are pitching themselves to the corporate elite and the military intelligence establishment. In this contest, the question is which party 
will be best placed to impose sweeping cuts to social spending, to enforce pro-business restructuring, and to lead Australia's involvement in a war with China. On those questions, Labor is seeking to outflank uh, the coalition from the right, and I'll provide just two brief examples of that. On Anzac Day, uh, Liberal Defence Minister Peter Dutton declared that it was necessary to prepare for war above all against China. Labor responded by agreeing that this was required, but by claiming that the government was not building up the military quick enough. Words needed to be matched by action, Albanese and other Labor leaders declared. And it was Labor that led the militarist hysteria that erupted in response to the signing of a security pact between the Solomon Islands and China during the campaign, with Penny Wong and other senior Labor leaders denouncing the coalition for failing to block the deal and warning of an expansion of Chinese influence. In other words, Labor is positioning itself as the preeminent party of war. Likewise, on the question of the economy, Albanese has continually de declared that Labor is the party of quote unquote, great reforms. He's told the Chamber of Commerce and other business forums that his government would seek to emulate the Labor governments of Bob Hawke and Paul Keating. Working with the trade unions, those Labor governments deregulated the economy, presided over the destruction of hundreds of thousands of jobs and instituted the mechanisms for a continuous assault on workers' wages and conditions. Albanese has also hearkened back to the Rudd and Gillard governments and their reforms, including opening up healthcare, education, and the disability sector to the full force of the capitalist market. Now that's what's on the agenda after the election. Whichever party forms government, their program will be massive spending cuts aimed at forcing the working class to pay for the hundreds of billions of dollars given to the corporations during the pandemic and a further onslaught on paying conditions in line with the demands of big business. <laughs> Under these conditions, what are the positions of the other parties contesting the election, especially those that sometimes posture as left? While the Greens are insisting that their overriding ambition is to enter into a power sharing arrangement with a minority Labor government. In other words, the Greens would prop up a right-wing Labor government as it enforces the dictates of finance capital, intensifies the drive to war and opens new coal mines. So much for the posturing on climate change. For their part, the pseudo left organizations such as Socialist Alliance, Socialist Alternative and its electoral front, the Victorian Socialists are peddling the lie that labor is a lesser evil and that workers must vote for labor and the Greens. These pseudo left parties have nothing to do with socialism or the interests of the working class. They represent an affluent layer of the upper middle class and their aim is to chain workers and young people to a political establishment that's hurtling to the right. The SEP is the only party telling the truth. This election will resolve nothing for workers and young people. We're not oriented to the rotten parliamentary setup, but to the emerging struggles of the working class expressed in strikes by nurses, and other health workers in New South Wales, teachers, aged care workers, and a growing uh, desire to fight really across the working class. Our election statement advances a fighting socialist program of action for this emerging movement. We're advancing uh, demands that we're calling for workers to take up relating to the struggle for wage increases and decent working conditions, the necessary measures to eliminate COVID, and policies required to end the social crisis, among others. But what we're stressing is that the fight for the interests of the working class requires a rebellion against the trade unions and a political fight against the whole capitalist setup. The SEP is assisting workers in the formation of rank and file committees, that is genuine fighting organisations controlled by workers themselves. Such committees are the only means of breaking the isolation and the sellout operations of the trade unions, uniting workers across Australia and internationally, and developing a genuine industrial and political counter-offensive against the onslaught on wages and conditions. An interconnected network of rank and file committees can and must serve as the basis for a new movement of the working class. And that's really the crucial issue. 
the independent action of the working class and its intervention into the political situation. This is the only means of fighting war, social counter-revolution, and the turn to authoritarianism by the ruling elites internationally. But above all, what we're raising is the need for workers, young people, and the most serious layers of the middle class to take up the perspective of socialist internationalism. The myriad issues that we face are existential uh, in their scope. The pandemic, the threat of nuclear war, and the environmental catastrophe, to name only three. None of these questions are the result of mistaken policies that can be changed through an election or through protest alone. They're rooted in the fundamental contradictions of the capitalist system itself. That is the contradictions between an integrated world economy and the division of the world into antagonistic capitalist nation states and between a socialized productive process involving literally billions of people and the private ownership of society's resources by a tiny capitalist elite. The great classical Marxists explained that at a certain point, these contradictions reach a breaking point and burst to the surface, ushering in a new period of wars and revolutions. That's what we're now uh, entering into. The decisive task is to build a socialist leadership in the working class to provide those struggles with the perspective, program and organization that they require for victory. The only means of ending war, the pandemic, and advancing the social interests of ordinary people is by uniting the working class internationally in a common struggle to end capitalism and establish world socialism. Under socialism, society's resources would be democratically controlled and allocated by the working class on an international scale to meet the needs of the population in a complex modern society. Reason and society, uh, excuse me, reason and science would be introduced into humanity's economy, creating the conditions to overcome all of the social ills that are the, are the result of the capitalist system. So I'll conclude by urging everyone here who's not yet a member of the SEP uh, to draw the necessary conclusions and to join this fight. Thanks. Thanks, Oscar. And uh, I do uh, appreciate that, uh, that our speakers and certainly Oscar has, will raise all sorts of issues, all sorts of uh, conceptions. Again, if you have any questions, please feel free uh, to um, ask about them. Our next speaker is Mike Head. Uh, Mike is actually 69. He is uh, an SEP a National Committee member. He is a very well-known, and I'm sure uh, even if you haven't met Mike, you will certainly know him from uh, his, uh, his articles and his correspondence on the World Socialist website. He's also a university, uh, Western Sydney University law lecturer, and he is in charge of our uh, Brisbane branch of, of the SEP. Mike actually has been a member for uh, 47 years, and he's married, he's got three adult children, and uh, he certainly has been played a central role in the intervention and the coverage of the disastrous uh, conditions and, and flooding which took place in Lismore and Queensland uh, over the last number of months. Mike actually joined the party in 1975 uh, and he joined prior to the ousting of the Whitlam government in November uh, 1975. And he joined because he became uh, very opposed and really alarmed at the rightward lurch uh, by the Whitlam government and the program of that government, which uh, in, involved mass attacks against the working class, um, cuts to, to programs and government spending, which that, that government was, was enacting. He, uh, he has, stood for, for the party in um, multiple elections in Queensland, in Oxley, um, as well as is other states. And so I'm very pleased to introduce Mike and, uh, and he will be our, our second speaker. So thanks, Mike. Thanks, Cheryl. The Socialist Equality Party is the only party standing in this election opposing the US-led war drive, 
which is now directed against both Russia and China. It is no accident that the issue of war has erupted on both sides of the world, in Europe and in the Indo-Pacific. There is a connection. It lies in Washington's push to defeat and dismember Russia and China, which it regards as obstacles to regaining and extending the global hegemony he asserted after two world wars last century. No war, whether in Ukraine or the Pacific, can be assessed by which government supposedly fired the first shot. We must probe the historical and material roots of the conflict. After three decades of one US-led war after another, since the dissolution of the Soviet Union, this is an historic war offensive by US imperialism and its allies, including Australia. It poses a very real threat of provoking a third world war for planetary domination and one fought with devastating nuclear weapons. American imperialism has goaded the Russian capitalist regime of Vladimir Putin relentlessly through two decades of NATO expansion toward Russia's borders. It orchestrated a fascist back coup in 2014 and then armed Ukraine to the teeth for a proxy war with Russia. The aim of the US NATO operation is not only gaining access to the vast resources of Russia, oil, gas, countless strategic minerals, Washington views the defeat of Moscow as a decisive step toward a military confrontation with China to establish US domination over the entire Eurasian landmass. Our election campaign is part of the fight by our world partners, the International Committee of the Fourth International, to clarify the causes and nature of this immense danger and mobilize the working class in Australia and internationally against it. As we say in our election statement, quote, only a unified anti-war movement of the international working class can halt this reckless plunge towards a nuclear catastrophe. There is a profound and explosive objective basis for this perspective. Work is everywhere, including in Russia, Ukraine, China, the US, and here, have a common class interest in stopping war and overturning the capitalist regimes responsible for it. The turn to war is an attempt by the ruling class and its government to divert outward the immense social and class tensions produced by staggering levels of social inequality. But around the world, the Ukraine war and the pouring of billions of dollars into military spending is fueling the conditions of inflation and austerity that are propelling workers into decisive and potentially revolutionary struggles, such as we see most sharply in Sri Lanka. War and socialist revolution go together as in World War I, which was only brought to an end by the impact of the October 1917 Russian Revolution. In the words of Leon Trotsky, the co-leader of that revolution and the founder of the Fourth International, we follow the map of the class struggle, not the war map. That is, the rising class battles must be linked to the fight against war. That requires the building of a revolutionary socialist leadership against all the capital parties, which have all lined up behind the US and its partners. As the World Socialist website warned in an editorial board statement on April 27, quote, the bloodshed in Ukraine was not provoked to defend its technical right to join NATO, but rather was prepared, instigated and massively escalated in order to destroy Russia as a significant military force and to overthrow its government. Ukraine is a pawn in this conflict and its population is cannon fodder. End of quote. The correctness of that analysis has been underscored by Thursday's announcement that Finland is set to join the US-led NATO military alliance, quote, without delay. The decision will more than double NATO's border with Russia to nearly 3,000 kilometers. Finland's capital city, Helsinki, is just three and a half hours by train from St. Petersburg, 
Russia's second biggest city. Finland is being followed by neighboring Sweden, whose governing social Democrats are overturning their decades long opposition to NATO membership. In the past, these governments did not seek full NATO membership, above all due to the widespread popular hostility to the aggressive US led military alliance in both those countries. The hysterical anti-Russia campaign whipped up following Putin's reactionary invasion of Ukraine has fermented the political condition for an historic shift towards war. Also this week, the US House of Representatives voted overwhelmingly for nearly $40 billion in military and financial aid to Ukraine. That underlines the Biden administration's commitment to supply virtually unlimited resources to its proxy war against Russia. It brings the total allocated to the war in Ukraine to a staggering $53 billion. That is more than the total US state and federal spending on public health. As the World Socialist website calculates, that amount of money could hire 500,000 teachers at $106,000 a year in salary and benefits, or a similar number of nurses. Instead, COVID funding was removed from the bill, even as the official death toll from the pandemic passed 1 million in the US, with another million likely by next year. This underlines the connection between war abroad and war at home. War means intensifying the assault on the working class, in order to pay for the war effort and to suppress dissent. Democrats voted unanimously for the Ukraine war funding, including Bernie Sanders, Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez, and the three other pseudo-left members of the Democratic Socialists of America. The Democratic Party has become the party of war, and the same is the case for the Labour Party here. Our party, the International Committee of the Fourth International has denounced the Russian invasion as a bankrupt nationalist response that divides the Russian and Ukrainian working class and plays into the hands of the US NATO offensive. But the source of the war threat lies in Washington, not Moscow. Far from being isolated from the danger of war, the Australian population has been placed on the front line by the support of both the coalition and Labor, backed by the trade unions, the Greens, and all the other parties. That includes the pseudo left groups, which have lined up behind US and Australian imperialism by denouncing so called Russian and Chinese imperialism. Echoing Biden, Prime Minister Morrison has provocatively declared that Australia is threatened by a quote, arc of autocracy in Russia and China. Defence Minister Dutton has said Australia must prepare for war against China. This week, Dutton claimed that a supposedly coast-hugging voyage by a Chinese intelligence ship, which never came close than 50 nautical miles or 93 kilometres off the Western Australian coast was an, quote, aggressive act. The ship was in international waters, but supposedly, but reportedly passed by the Harold E. Holt Naval Communications Station at Exmouth, one of the numerous US integrated war bases in Australia. Labor has sought to outbid the coalition in order to position itself as the party most aligned to Washington and best able to lead the country in war. Shadow Foreign Affairs Minister Penny Wong accused the government of committing, quote, the worst Australian foreign policy blunder in the Pacific since the end of World War II, close quote by allowing Solomon Islands to sign a security agreement with China. Even as it ramps up the Ukraine war, the US has not let up pressure, threats, and provocations against China, in which Australia is playing a central role. The Morrison government with Labor's full support joined the AUKUS pact with the US and the UK last September. Australia's military is now acquiring nuclear power to attack submarines and hypersonic missiles. There is, a bi there is bipartisan support for a military budget of over $600 billion this decade. As we ask in our election statement, who will pay this gigantium sum? Inevitably, it will be the working class. In a party statement on May 8, 
the SEP denounced the threats of military intervention being made by the US and Australia against Solomon Islands, a small Pacific Islands former British colony. We have called on workers in Australia and the US, as well as across the Pacific and internationally, to oppose the preparations being made to oust that country's democratically elected government. With the assistance of Australian partners, the US ruling class is intent on retaining domination, the domination over the Pacific that it established after defeating Japan in World War II. No Chinese foothold, no matter how limited, can be tolerated that would in any way challenge Washington's grip over the vast ocean. The menacing attitude of the US and Australia to the Solomons further exposes the lie that the US war plans against Russia and China are about defending democracy or national sovereignty. Washington and Canberra have said Ukraine's sovereign right to join the NATO military alliance must be upheld. However, when it comes to Pacific Island states, impoverished ones at that, national sovereignty is treated with contempt. The fraud of these governments representing the forces of democracy is also nakedly exposed by the endless incarceration of WikiLeaks founder Julian Assange, an Australian citizen, for exposing the war crimes and diplomatic intrigues perpetrated by the US and its allies. Assange is being persecuted and dragged off to the US to be silenced for life. That is ju not just because he helped tell the world the truth about the past atrocities of the US led forces, it is because of the new, even greater crimes being unleashed and prepared as the conflicts escalate against Russia and China. That is why at the National Press Club on Friday, Labor's Penny Wong reiterated that Labor backed the coalition's refusal to offer Assange anything more than meaningless so-called consular support. And she said his fate is, quote, ultimately the decision of the American administration. As some of the photos from our election campaign have shown, the SEP is continuing to take the fight for Assange's freedom into the working class, making it a central feature of our campaign. Above all, the crucial task is to build a global anti-war movement of the working class and to build the International Committee of the Fourth International as the World Party of Socialist Revolution to lead that struggle and the fight for international socialism. This is the only way to end the threat of a catastrophic third world war. We urge everyone taking part in this meeting to join the SEP to take forward this life and death struggle. Thank you. Thanks, Mike. Um, look, I think the points that, that Mike has raised in particular uh, regarding the defense of Julian Assange are very important as he raised these, uh, the persecution of Assange is certainly because of the exposure of past crimes, but it is also to intimidate anybody who intends to expose future crimes and present ones of which there are many. And it is an attempt to silence the, the working class and particularly young people. Our next speaker is, uh, is Peter Byrne, and Peter is uh, 63. He is standing in the uh, Senate for the SEP in Victoria. Uh, he's an architect and he is the son of a car worker, and he joined the Socialist Labor League, which is the forerunner of the SEP in 1983, so almost 40 years ago. Now, Peter joined as a student who was opposed to the threat of nuclear war. And as I go through the uh, biography of our candidates, you will see that there is a thread that runs through all of them. And that is uh, the, the opposition to war and uh, the uh, fear of the development of nuclear war. Peter was involved in multiple different organisations on campus, uh, which were opposed to nuclear energy and which 
in one form or other became the people for nuclear disarmament. But it was really the clarification which the SLL was able to provide uh, to Peter about the role of those organisations, protest organisations, and those that became uh, the organisations that we refer to as the pseudo left, whose position was that you can change uh, and appeal to governments, change the minds of, of governments and of capitalism through pressure and protest. As I raised in my opening remarks, nothing could be more bankrupt and more futile. And so it was, it was that understanding that Peter was able to uh, develop through his discussions with SLL members that led him to, to join the party. He now and has for the last 40 years played a leading role in the work of our party in Melbourne and in Victoria. And he has uh, is featured in campaigns to defend jobs of uh, car workers, building workers, pilots and teachers. He's represented the SEP in Victorian elections, in federal elections, in by-elections. Um, and in 2019, he stood in the seat of Caldwell, where he exposed the role of the Greens, of Labor, and again of the Victorian socialists, the pseudo-lefts. And all of those organisations sought to divert what became very evident uh, in the election result as the immense hostility among workers and young people to the official establishment. The role of the Greens and of these uh, other parties was to divert that opposition back behind the parliamentary system. So uh, Peter will uh, speak to you today on the developing movement of the working class here and internationally. Thanks, Cheryl. Um, look, this election takes place under the threat of world war, um, as, as Mike has just gone through, but it also is a time of a growing movement of the working class internationally. The pr two processes are intimately connected. In Australia, we've seen an upsurge in strikes during the election campaign, despite the best attempts of the unions to stifle any industrial action to boost the Labor Party's appeals to big business as the party that can best contain and control the working class. Nurses, teachers, bus drivers, aged care workers, university staff and council workers have all taken strike action, demanding increased wages and conditions. Eric London is a writer for the World Socialist website who has written on many of the major struggles of the working class in the US and internationally. He has been crucially involved in the International Committee of the Fourth International's initiative, establishing the International Workers Alliance of Rank and File Committees on May Day 2021. On May Day 2022, the ICFI held our International May Day online rally. Eric spoke on the growing struggles of the working class internationally. We want to play a short excerpt of his remarkable address. This is a map of the war in Ukraine. The imperialist powers, best trained generals, foreign policy experts and intelligence analysts have spent years hunched over this map, plotting offensives, positioning soldiers, gaming the enemy's response and preparing public opinion with lies that turn the world on its head. But this is the map of the class struggle. It shows that a mass movement of historically unprecedented proportions is developing across the world. And this movement, depicted in this map, shows that the working class can stop world war and carry out the socialist transformation of the world. Each pin on this map is a strike that has taken place in the last nine weeks since Russia launched its invasion of Ukraine. Here are the strikes at the world's ports, each a critical choke point to international sea shipping. Purple marks the strikes by rail workers. Black denotes the strikes at many of the world's busiest airports. Each brown pin is a strike of bus, truck, waste collection, or delivery drivers. Orange indicates a strike of garment workers. Dark green pins are strikes by nurses. Light green shows strikes by oil and gas workers, and blue shows strikes by teachers, while gray depicts strikes by food production workers. Finally, 
Yellow marks places where national strikes or mass protests have exploded over the rapidly rising cost of living, greatly exacerbated by NATO and U.S. sanctions, which they call humanitarian, but which are throwing hundreds of millions to the brink of starvation. Each of these pins represents the tremendous courage and determination of the working class in struggle. Take the school teachers in the city of Nayala in South Darfur, Sudan, who all walked out in March the day after police attempted to burst into a classroom to arrest students who had participated in food protests that are spreading throughout the country. When teachers blocked the way to protect their pupils, police beat them brutally and publicly humiliated three teachers. But the demonstrations that followed in the working class were, according to local radio, massive and unprecedented. Teachers closed the schools and also the banks for good measure. The courage of teachers in Nyala spurred a renewed wave of national strikes and protests across the country, protesting against the military dictatorship and the unbearable cost of living. Workers are sacrificing their lives and freedoms in the fight for a better world as they confront the capitalist state, its police, militaries, and courts. In Sri Lanka, Charminda Lakshan, a 40-year-old husband and father, was shot and killed by police at a demonstration over fuel and food prices. Six workers and youth were killed in protests in Peru, and over 90 have been killed in Sudan. Thousands of striking workers have been arrested in recent weeks for no crime at all. Such is justice in the capitalist courts of every country. In Maharashtra, India, 118 bus drivers participating in a major strike face criminal charges of rioting simply because they protested at the home of a politician who's attempting to privatize bus lines. What does this map tell us about the character of the emerging movement and the strategy that is required to meet workers' demands? The strikes and mass protests give a powerful sense of the character of the international working class in the 21st century and its organic striving for unity. As I said, um, you know, it's a remarkable video. And if you haven't yet watched um, the full uh, May Day uh, video, I certainly urge you to do it. And I'm sure if you've watched it, you should re-watch it. Um, we need to look at the ongoing crisis of capitalist rule in Sri Lanka. Eric referred to the shooting of Chaminda Lakshan, a worker who was participating in mass protests against food shortages and price hikes and was gunned down by police on April the 19th. On May the 6th, President Gotabaya Rajapaksa proclaimed a state of emergency in response to the massive one-day general strikes held on April the 28th and May the 6th. The President has draconian powers under the state of emergency to arrest people without a warrant, ban strikes, protests and meetings, impose curfews, censor the media and prescribe political parties. This declaration of a state of emergency was in response to the enormous power of the general strikes that took the Sri Lankan ruling class and the trade unions by surprise. The unions claimed it was an, quote, unexpected success. The crisis in Sri Lanka is the sharpest expression of the crisis of the capitalist system internationally. The pandemic and the US-NATO war against Russia in the Ukraine has made matters much worse. Since April the 9th, Sri Lanka has been engulfed by protests against food and fuel shortages and skyrocketing prices. Electricity has been cut for hours each day due to food shortages, sorry, fuel shortages. In April, 250,000 teachers took one day strike action demanding Rajapaksa's resignation. Then on April the 28th, the nationwide strike stopped the nation. Very significantly, the actions have united workers across ethnic and religious lines. Sinhala, Tamil, Muslim, Buddhist, Hindu and Christian workers have united. For decades, the Sri Lankan ruling class has promoted divisions between every group. Um, this slide just gives you some, some of the details of price rises. Um, we've seen you know, increases in, in all the basic commodities with skyrocketing inflation. Uh, a kilo of rice, for example, has gone from 95 to 120 rupees a kilo which is only 35 US cents in January, up to 200 to 240. That is a double, you know, doubling of price. You know, that is the most, um, you know, one of the most basic staples for the working class in Sri Lanka. The, um, now looking at the situation in Australia, 
um, the official inflation rate in Australia is now sitting at 5.1%, and the figure for non-discretionary items is even higher at 6.6%. The issue of wages is now a central concern of the working class. In the WSWS article published Tuesday, our candidate for the Senate in Queensland, John Davis, explained that both major parties are committed to keeping wages low. Um, as Oscar went through, Morrison's refused to support what workers receiving even the minimum wage, while Albanese has refused point blank to guarantee that workers' wages will rise faster than inflation. In other words, he's, he's advocating a real wage cut. The Labor Party has even reversed a previous election promise to raise the starvation level job seeker allowance. Albanese stated last week, the key to lifting wages is lifting productivity. Thus, Albanese is stating categorically that they will not reinstate a system of wages increases based on inflation rises that his predecessor, Bob Hawke, overturned in 1983. Albanese, Albanese is demanding that workers essentially pay for their own pay rises through productivity improvements. But look at how that really works. Uh, in this graph, um, you can see, sorry, the, the difference um, with uh, growing productivity since 1990 um, and the, the level of wages of workers. So the gap, the widening gap between those two lines represents the profit that's been realised by capitalism um, through productivity increases. So, you know, essentially this uh, position of Albanese is a, is a lie um, that workers will benefit uh, from pro productivity in, um, increases. Um, we spoke with workers at the Dyson pick picket um, last Friday week in Bandura and the only way that bus drivers could increase productivity is through longer working hours, less breaks, or by breaking the speed limit. Coles warehouse workers, um, who we spoke to at Truganina and Somerton warehouses, uh, for them productivity increases mean their jobs being replaced by automated warehouses, and where that is not possible, by cobots, that is robots that can work alongside humans and do the tasks that they are not yet able to be um, automated. The policies of the Labor Party are being backed by the unions. The unions are devoting huge resources to the election of the Labor government. If elected, the unions will enforce Albanese's demands for productivity increases. So with the unions and Labor Party proven as opponents of the struggles of the working class, what must be done? Again, I want to quote from um, a statement by uh, Eric that he made in, the, in, the, um, in his May Day speech. He said, Rank and file committees are the form of organisation needed to meet the needs of this growing movement. They are the historically necessary organ of international working class struggle in the world of the 21st century. The International Workers Alliance of Rank and File Committees is an international working class organisation established by the International Committee at the May Day rally held one year ago to unite and provide support and leadership for the development of workers' rank and file committees worldwide. The IWA RFC's purpose is to draw the different sections of the working class, all its heterogeneous layers and component parts into one unified movement to help it unlock its tremendous social power, to encourage its organic striving for independence and unity, to introduce workers to the historical lessons of the class struggle and to free them from the handcuffs of national trade unionism so they can extend their hands across industries and national boundaries to their fellow workers in a global struggle to take power out of the hands of the financial aristocracy and imperialist warmongers. The Socialist Equality Party in Australia has established a number of rank and file committees. The, the Committee for Public Education is a rank and file committee for school and university teachers, parents and students to defend public education against the ongoing attacks by every government that the teachers unions enforce. The Australia Post Rank and File Committee is a forum for Australia Post workers to oppose the drive to privatisation and never ending productivity drive, which Albanese has explicitly linked to any further pay rises. A health workers rank and file group has been established to unite doctors, nurses, hospital, food and cleaning staff, aged care workers, ambulance drivers, pathology workers, and all health workers in a common struggle for a decent health system. This is just the beginning of what workers need to do to advance their interests. We're often asked on campaigns what the difference is between the Socialist Equality Party and the Victorian Socialists and Socialist Alliance, organisations that we term pseudo-left. 
One of the crucial differences is our fight for the political independence of the working class. Only the SEP calls for the formation of rank and file committees. The pseudo left parties demand that workers stay within the unions and support the Labor Party and vehemently oppose any alternative. Finally, I just want to refer to some of the concrete demands that we're advancing in this election. These, these are from our election statement. Um, I'll just read a couple. An immediate rise in all pay to compensate for past erosion. Index all wages to the current cost of living and introduce an automatic monthly cost of living adjustment to keep pace with rising expenses. We say a living wage for all those unable to work, end poverty level payments to the elderly, disabled and unemployed, abolish all mutual obligation requirements and other degrading measures imposed by Centrelink. To take forward the struggles of the working class, the most critical factor is the growth and development of the Socialist Equality Party. Thank you. Thank you, Peter. Um, look, I think the three speakers have very eloquently outlined different aspects of both the crisis which confronts ordinary people and, most importantly, a perspective to meet that crisis. At this point, we will open up for questions. Now, what I want to do uh, is introduce the other three candidates. I will uh, introduce them one by one and they can uh, uh, come on, on camera as the other three candidates will as well. So one, you can see all our candidates and you can address and uh, orient any questions to them. So uh, the first uh, person I'd like to introduce is uh, Max Body. And Max is 33. He is the Assistant National Secretary of the SEP and he's a member of the National Committee and he joined the SEP in 2011. He also writes for the WSWS, particularly on the defence and the opposition to the inhumane treatment of asylum seekers, and also in particular on the NDIS. Uh, he went to the University of Newcastle and he has a Bachelor of Arts degree in Aboriginal Studies. Now, Max, as a young 18-year-old, uh, in his first election in which he could vote, uh, voted for the Rudd Labor government. He did that on the basis that Rudd would uh, oppose the, the um, wars in the Middle East, would withdraw uh, Australian troops, end the wars, uh, that he would also, and this is what Rudd put forward, stop the attacks on refugees, on uh, the horrendous conditions of Aboriginal workers. Um, but in fact, Rudd did the exact opposite. As, as Max has outlined, he deepened uh, the, the Northern Territory intervention. He did not end the wars and he kept refugees imprisoned. And so Max started to look for an alternative and he found the IYSC on the campus of uh, the University of Newcastle. And he was also particularly attracted to the fight for, of the IYSC and the SEP to internationalism. Max joined in 2011 and now plays a central role in all aspects of the fight of the party. He stood in the 2019 election uh, in the seat of Hunter, and of course he is standing in this election. So I'd ask Max to come on camera and introduce him, there you go. Thank you, uh, <laughs> our next um, candidate is Jason Wardle, and Jason is 30. He is the president of the IYSC at Victoria University in Melbourne. Um, he, he hails from Perth, and uh, his, his father and his uncles were merchant seamen. Um, and he worked in Perth for a whole period as uh, on casual as a construction labourer. And uh, he has also represented the SEP in the 2019 elections. Again, Jason, as I've, I've uh, outlined, became politically active as a result of his opposition to militarism and war. And in particular, 
against the US-led interventions, which of course the Australian government supported in Libya and Syria. Um, and also his, his growing opposition and consternation at, the, uh, at Washington's confrontation with China in the Asia Pacific. He turned to the SEP after growing uh, disillusioned with the program of, of labor. Um, and of course, all those acolytes who, who defend and prop up the Labor Party. Uh, Jason lives in Melbourne at the moment, and he joined the, uh, the SEP in 2017, and he's already on camera. G'day, Jason. And our final candidate of our six is John Davis. John is 28. Uh, and he joined the SEP in 2013. And again, uh, he joined on the basis of the fight against militarism, against war, and because the, the SEP fought for a program of socialism and internationalism. He, he, John, in describing what attracted him uh, to the SEP, and he also uh, joined through by meeting the IYSSE at the University of, of Newcastle. But John also was very concerned about the issues of war in Iraq and Syria, the fear and the uh, uh, threat of the outbreak of Third World War uh, against Russia and China, and also the, the social conditions, which as a young man in Newcastle, uh, he, he confronted in attempting to find work, the, the prospect of an ever-present prospect of homelessness, having to work in uh, uh, casual, uh, very low-paid work, um, and this was a constant threat. And as he said, and I think he, you know, in that sense, he was very graphic and honest about it. He said, I, I had a very real feeling of hopelessness and uncertainty before I met the party. I wanted to know what could be done, but was struggling to find answers. Um, and he, he gave as an example, he, he picked politics as his first course at university, but that he became very disillusioned with that very quickly. And so when he joined uh, the IYSSE and the SEP, he, he embraced uh, the, the political perspective and program of the International Committee. And he plays a central role uh, in the fight for the building of the, the party in Newcastle and the Central Coast. He stood, uh, he's actually stood in, the, uh, in elections in 2016 and 2019. So he, uh, in the ripe old age of 28, is a very uh, seasoned campaigner for the party in elections. Uh, so if the other candidates would like to put on their cameras, we will now open up for, um, uh, for any questions. And I know we have got one in particular, uh, which was where do you get more accurate data, particularly on uh, the pandemic, which is an absolutely valid um, question. And uh, I mean, I will, I, I will raise it because I think it was, uh, Charlie was referring to some of the statistics that I presented in my opening. Um, how, very, with a great deal of difficulty, Charlie, to be frank, uh, it is, it is, um, information which is not readily available to ordinary people. Uh, it, it, has to be, it has to be found, it has to be searched for, it has to be uh, dug into. Um, there is all sorts of, of uh, areas and, and databases. Um, I mean, there is the Worldometer, there is the John Hopkins um, uh, uh, data. Uh, there's also, um, and we, we'll put them, put the uh, uh, links on, um, on the chat for you. Uh, but the point is that the information and the data which is now available, as, as I think I raised, is entirely 
uh, spurious. It is entirely unstated, under understated, um, and uh, it, it has to be extrapolated. It has to be it has to be uh, presented in a way which is accessible for ordinary people. The data is there, um, and to be frank, it is it is only really on the World Socialist website and in in the uh, fight that the SEP uh, undertakes that uh, that this is available not just in Australia but but internationally, um, but possibly some of the other uh, uh, um, candidates will will be able to uh, develop on that. There is also a question from Vicky: Do you envisage a Russian retreat? from Ukraine if workers stand in solidarity to oppose the expansion of NATO. Um, and there's, well, why don't we take that? There's another question on who are the teal independents? Uh, is it true that they hold significant sway over the election this year? What is the difference between them, Labor, the Greens and the coalition? Um, Look, I'll take those two because they are, and then there's others that are coming in now. Uh, if there's, are there any of the candidates who, who want to deal with uh, Vicky's question on uh, how do we, do we envisage a Russian retreat if workers um, stand in solidarity? Yeah, I could start on that one. Um, look, I, I think this is not just a war in Ukraine. This is the beginning, really, of a potential third world war. When Biden has said, and other Washington leaders have said, uh, this is a war to defeat Russia. This is a war for victory. What does victory mean in Ukraine? It means not stopping in Ukraine, but uh, driving Russia out of Ukraine, but also continuing the war uh, to victory. And that is also intended to provoke the Putin regime into uh, some kind of uh, escalation, even a nuclear escalation. That's why we've warned that the US is prepared to risk the threat of nuclear war in order to uh, achieve its drive to really break up and subjugate uh, Russia. Now, we are fighting, yes, for a un unified movement of the Russian and Ukrainian and international working class against this really barbaric use of Ukraine as uh, cannon fodder, even collateral damage, you might say, uh, in this conflict. A conflict which has been prepared for, in, in fact, for decades since the dissolution of the Soviet Union. Now, we're not, um, you know, we can't speculate entirely on what's going to happen in the conflict. We're fighting to develop, as we've discussed, a map of the class struggle in order to develop this uh, oppositional uh, movement. But we know it will mean nothing less than the um, well, the, the a movement against uh, the government in the United States and in the other NATO countries, and as, as Oscar pointed out, in Germany, where the military budget has tripled this year as German militarism gets its boots on again uh, to move east, as it did under the Nazis when they invaded the Soviet Union in the Second World War. And of course, German imperialism also uh, tried to uh, take over you know, Europe in, in the First World War. So all these old conflicts are emerging. So our perspective is that really the only way to stop the threat of Third World War is socialist revolution. Uh, and that's a, that's a worldwide fight. Uh, we don't rule out there could be you know, retreats at various points. But this world war, like the previous ones, really raises the question of the working class unifying its struggles across national borders and 
turning, you know, as Lenin said, you know, the, the main enemy is at home. Turn the war, he said, turn the war into a civil war. Well, we that's our basic perspective. For workers to turn against their governments. Um, but that that raises, of course, the question of uh, of a socialist overturn. That's the only uh, realistic alternative uh, to the war fever, you know, of, of the imperialist uh, of the imperialist powers. We certainly, just to conclude, we certainly encourage and welcome all moves by workers in Ukraine and Russia, you know, against the regimes responsible for it, but. We have no illusions that this this war poses nothing less than the necessity for the working class to take power into its own hands, you know, in all the imperialist centers, including the United States, and here, you know, as a uh, to end the to end the threat to the planet from a, another world war. I, I just put it that way. Uh, this this is a this is not a temporary war. It's not a regionally isolated war. This is the beginning of a new war drive, which uh, the working class is the only force is the international working class can uh, can put an end to put an end to. Yeah, I'll just put it that way. Thanks, Mike. Um, and again, look, the the candidates can um, add to to these issues, uh, develop uh, answers. You're certainly welcome to jump in. Uh, I am conscious of time, and there are a, a couple of, of questions. I mean, there is the question of who are the teal independents, um, which I think Max uh, could answer. Yeah, is that? Yeah. 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 Yeah, well, look, I think uh, in beginning to answer that question, I think the first point to make about these so-called independents is there's nothing independent about them at all. They all are closely tied by a thousand strings to capitalism and the parliamentary establishment. Uh, their candidates are in one form or another, either um, you know, ex-corporate lawyers, ex, you know, ABC journalists. They're funded by the Climate 200 group, which was set up by uh, Simon Holmes Court, uh, who is the son of Australia's first billionaire. Uh, I think it's Robert Holmes Court. Uh, and there's now a $10 million campaign to put them forward as some kind of alternative. Uh, I mean, on the question of differences uh, between Labor and the coalition and them, what the Teal uh, so-called in independents reflect is, you know, really rival interests with Australia's corporate elite on the question of climate issues. I mean, for decades in this country, uh, fossil fuels, mining, I mean, that's dictated politics. But there is another wing of the big business elite, the so-called green sector, which is, you know, stands to gain billions of dollars uh, with, you know, through profits, through government subsidies, tax breaks, et cetera. Um, but all of this is driven and all of what they put forward is through the framework of the capitalist system. I mean, the, the fact is global warming itself is an existential threat to humanity and it's been ignored. And that's why we have situations in which there's rising temperatures, mass bushfires, flooding, uh, and in all those instances, workers are left on their own and, and ignored, causing mass homelessness. Um, and I think that the fact that their policies are limited to the capitalist profit system means that, that nothing will change. It's all on the dictates of big business uh, and whatever this new kind of green sector business and their, their wealth. I mean, and they also pose no threat whatsoever to the parliamentary system. What they're intending to do is to utilise and divert the anger and hostility to the major parties back under a parliamentary system. However, as you've probably seen, there is something of a vitriolic campaign against them. Um, and but that itself is the result, not of them challenging the parliamentary system, but of deep fear uh, that, uh, that a hung parliament or some amalgamation of a minority government are not going to be able to implement the, uh, the dictates of big business, uh, you know, the austerity measures to be brought against the working class and the drive to war, uh, both in Russia, but above all in this region, and the question of China. And that's where those concerns come from. I mean, I think that Comrade Cheryl, in her opening remarks, pointing to Sagittarius A 
and the immense scientific achievement these images are, and that this gives you just a peek of what uh, you know a, a society under socialism would be, uh, that where science is allowed to you know develop um, at, on the basis not of profit but of on uh, the development of humanity. I mean, such uh, such a question is also placed on the question of climate change. I mean, to combat the rising uh, temperatures, to combat the crisis. And as I said, the existential threat that faces humanity requires a complete reorganisation of society based on need, not profit. So that's how I, I, I answer that question. Yeah. Thanks, Max. Now, we have um, a couple of more, more questions. Brenton has asked, what are we to make of some of these Trumpian fascist Republicans making speeches and it appears voting against funding in this war for the war? I have reflected uh, that it is likely part and parcel of a strategy to get Trump or other fascist Republicans into the presidency in a few years' time by them being able to claim that they oppose spending billions on war and would have instead used it for problems at home. Uh, emotive populist appeals to get back into power. It does seem like posing as opposed to the war might be part of their we are against the establishment posturing next cycle thoughts. Um, okay, so, I mean, that that is a question which Oscar will uh, address. And Kerry has raised seemingly identity politics has dropped off from bourgeois political discussions. Could you explain this development? Thank you. That's a good question. Um, and also Morgan has asked throughout the election, many people have asked me about the SEP's attitude to voting preferences. What are the party's preferences? Should we be doing everything we can in this election to get rid of right-wing parties? Okay, so we have three uh, good questions. While our candidates are gathering their thoughts, I do want to take this opportunity to appeal to everybody in the meeting to donate to our election fund. We have launched a $50,000 election fund and we have uh, raised collections at all our meetings and have been uh, provided with very generous donations. The reason for the fund is because standing candidates, and this again is bound up with the entirely anti-democratic processes, uh, which uh, uh, are the elections in this country. It is extraordinarily expensive, can, uh, standing candidates, even the nomination fees have doubled this year. We, uh, we have to provide um, uh, money for our election uh, statements, uh, we've boosting on, on social media, uh, travel, all sorts of, of expenses which are bound up with standing candidates in, in the election. And the only source that our funding comes from is you, is from ordinary people, from supporters, from our electoral members, from workers, young people. Uh, we don't get state funding we wouldn't accept state funding. Uh, we don't get sponsorship from corporations. We get nothing other than the uh, support and the resources from ordinary people. And so we very much ask you to consider how much you can, you can donate, how generous you can be. You can uh, provide pledges to be paid by the end of June. Um, uh, but we really want you to consider as much as possible how much you can uh, con contribute to our monthly fund. And, uh, and, and in so doing, to provide us with the resources that are so necessary in, uh, in the fight for uh, the, the development of a socialist perspective. We will um, continue with the uh, answering of the questions I think uh, Oscar was going to uh, answer the, the question that, that uh, Brenton raised. Uh, I think the question from Brenton's a, an interesting one. I mean, there are certain layers, uh, particularly associated with the Trump wing of the Republican Party, who have criticised aspects of um, the Biden administration's program 
in relation to Ukraine. Some of them are, are threatening um, to block, you know, this latest $40 billion um, appropriation bill, you know, to send more weapons to Ukraine. I think the, the point uh, that needs to be emphasised is that there's no anti-war faction, you know, within the American political establishment, just as there's no anti-war faction uh, within the ruling elite here. Um, I think what, you know, these Republican Party figures are expressing are tactical divisions within the ruling elite really over how best to wage war, not whether to wage war. Um, I mean, comrades will recall that during Trump's presidency, really the only criticism uh, that, the, that the Democrats levelled against him um, was that he was supposedly soft on Russia and, and soft on Putin. Uh, there was no basis, in fact, for that. But what they were expressing was the sentiment uh, of, you know, a key wing of, of the military intelligence establishment that it was necessary to go to war against Russia um, before launching an attack on China, you know, the principal obstacle to US dominance. Um, and that's what they've done, the Democrats, now that they're in power. Trump and those around him, such as Stephen Bannon, uh, were very much oriented towards immediate conflict with China. Um, I mean, Bannon, who's one of these figures that I think Brenton is referencing, has said, we're already in a war with China. This has to be the focus. It's going to be a military conflict within the next couple of years. Uh, and what's taking place in Ukraine is a, a diversion from that. So I think, you know, if you were to sum it up, sort of rival uh, proposals for how to start nuclear world war. I mean, that's the state of official American politics, but politics everywhere. Uh, so clearly, you know, in the fight against militarism, war, uh, the key issue is the political independence of the working class from Democrats, Republicans, uh, you know, the fascistic Trump layers, and, you know, a perspective of unifying with workers internationally against the source of, of conflict, uh, the capitalist system itself. Um, thanks, Oscar. We, we have Kerry's question on identity politics. Um, actually, maybe while somebody is, and Peter, I don't know whether you'd like to, to deal with that. Uh, Jason said that he would like to answer the question on preferential voting. So I'll hand it over to you, Jason. Yeah, so the question was, um, what are our attitudes towards preferential voting and I suppose more broadly uh, opposing right-wing parties through sending our votes to lesser evil parties that would be the broad concept here um i guess the the main thing to point out is that our position is that it's incredibly anti-democratic the idea of preferential voting i mean people are giving their votes to a political party and then that, that party is forced to flow them on to Labor, Liberal or the Greens. I mean, it's, I'm not sure where, how much this actually exists in the world. It's just a, it is something that exists in Australia. We've always pointed out as being anti-democratic. Um, we've taken different positions in the past, trying to make the, the correct you know, view and uh, orientation towards it. I know at one stage, it was the ideas that we would um, give it a free vote, but then people found find this complex. You know, people were supposed to vote below the line and so on. And it turns out if you get one number wrong, you don't do it right, the whole thing's thrown out and it invalidates the vote. So we just don't get the vote. Um, and then at a different stage, we decided to split the votes preferentially towards the three parties, um, if it, essentially not preferencing any of them in practice. I'm not sure what we're doing specifically with this um election but the idea that that i mean if you go back decades we would have actually supported say up until maybe the 70s 80s we could have supported this or that reform wing trade union wing in the labor party or something like this um you know critically but today after the last few decades of globalization of uh these parties having the exact same political program that, you know, they are just going to put in the same right-wing agenda, no matter what the Greens say about phasing out mining and coal and all that, that they, they are all deeply reactionary pro-war parties, um, similar to what we were just saying about there being no 
anti-war faction in the bourgeois. There's no um, kind of faction there that's going to help workers, their wages, anything like this. So we don't preferentially vote, nor do we um, kind of split hairs over these different factions either. We basically um, oppose this. And we pose the idea that uh, this would in some way... Um, you know, strengthen the right or something. It would actually, if we were to do such a thing, make deals with the Greens, do all this, it would, uh, you know, it would, it would unclar, it wouldn't clarify the working class on what these organisations are. It would, you know, pro promote confusions and illusions and such as well. So, I mean, that's my, uh, you know, best answer. We do have articles on it going through the complexities of it. Um, it is a, a purpose purposefully obfuscating the way the election um, system works, but uh, maybe someone else wants to add to the answer. Uh, is there another candidate who wants to add to Jason's answer? Um, Mike, did you want to add I'll, something? I agree with what Jason said. Um, interestingly, as he pointed out, Australia is one of the few countries where you have such a preferential system. And its history goes back to the you know, the coalition between the Liberal Party and the Country Party, as it, as it used to be. So it's a device, a mechanism for ensuring that votes get channeled back, whether you like it or not, you know, to one of the major parties. You can vote for anybody, but in the end, because you've got to give preferences for those votes, unless your candidate, you know, wins, your vote goes to somebody who you don't want. Um, you're forced to vote for somebody you don't want under the preferential uh, system. It is completely anti-democratic. Now it's been modified slightly in the Senate. You've only got to put six across the top or 12 underneath the line. Now our how, 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 how to vote, it's important to be clear on this, we've uh, urged people to vote one. For us, our party name is not there on the ballot paper, but you'll see our names on each of the three ballot papers. You put a big one at the top, in the big square at the top, for our unnamed group. And then we just say, allocate your other numbers any way you like. You know, it really does not make a great deal of difference, to be quite frank. The other parties, all in one form or another, are capitalist parties committed to maintaining the profit system um, against the working class. So we really don't think uh, there's any preference that we would allocate to any other party whatsoever. And we certainly are not doing any deals, horse trading, which is what uh, does go on as well. You know, swapping preferences and so on. We, we have no truck with any of that. Because again, we're standing in the election to broadcast a socialist voice, a socialist opposition, to build a movement in the working class. The, the, the uh, votes, uh, you know, Deal wheels and deals is that's not our that's not our game. You know we're we're saying there is only one way out, and that is to build this party um, and the world party of social evolution. So I think that explains why we don't allocate any preferences. It's true, as Jason said in the past, back in the you know until the eighties, we we did call for a you know a vote for Labor, but only on the basis of that demand socialist policies from them that had some meaning back then. It has no meaning whatsoever anymore. The Labor Party has been transformed with the unions into outright open you know, police agencies of, of, uh, of ruling class policy. Uh, and that's what Labor is offering uh, today. A more, um, you know, when people say unite against the right, well, unite with whom against the right? Albanese and the Labor Party uh, are more, in some ways, more right, right wing than the Liberals. Both, as, as Oscar pointed out, both on domestic policy and on uh, the war policy. So I'll, I'll just leave it there for that. Right. So, just to emphasize what uh, Jason and Mike has just gone through, we have uh, the how to vote um, or the, the explanation on voting. Now, as Mike said, it is, it is not clear. The, what you have to remember is we vote above the line. The, the six that we have to vote for, the six boxes that have to be ticked, 
They all have to be above the line. Um, so as, as Mike said, vote one in, in New South Wales, it's uh, Max Body and Oscar Grenfell. The uh, above the line will, will not have the party, party name. And so you have to know to vote for Max and Oscar. In Queensland, it is Mike and John Davis. Again, the, the party name is not above the line. It will be blank. Um, and it, I think, I think I'm, I'm correct in saying this, that in Queensland and New South Wales, only the SEP has a blank, uh, a blank area where the party name is. In Victoria, there's numbers of different ones. <clears throat> so... In Queensland and New South Wales, the, the only party which is blank is the SEP. But you've got to remember the names to make sure that you're voting for the right uh, candidates. In Victoria, it is uh, Jason uh, Wardle and Peter Byrne. And again, that is uh, Group Y. So in it's Group F in New South Wales, no party name, Oscar and Max. In Queensland, it is Group I, no party name, uh, Mike and John Davis. In Victoria, it is uh, Y, Group Y, and it is uh, Jason Wardle and Peter Byrne. So you have to vote one and then five, six, uh, two, three, four, five, six, above the line. We clear. <laughs> I know it's it's torturous. It is torturous, not um, uh, not for accidental reasons. It is to make it as difficult as possible. Um, and we do not call for a vote for any other party. We do not advocate a, a, a vote for any other organisation. It is only the SEP. Um, because there, there, there is no other organisation that in any way even purports to represent the interests of the working class. We, as Jason said, this is not the 1980s. There is no uh, critical, uh, a call for a critical vote for anybody else. All these organisations represent the interests of capitalism against the working class. And that is an increasingly exposed uh, position. Now, uh, we, we have... Sorry, Cheryl, there is a related question in the chat. Just is it, can we advocate an informal vote? Yeah, you can. The High Court actually ruled that way a while ago. You can, and we do advocate an informal vote where we're not standing. Don't vote for any of them. I'll write yeah. Socialist Party Party on your ballot paper. <laughs> but where we are standing, we've got to take great care to vote uh, validly for us. Yes, that's right. Uh, now, the, the, there was the other question uh, by Kerry that Peter's going to uh, uh, deal with, which is the identity politics has dropped off from, uh, from discussions. Could we explain that? Thanks, Kerry. Look, one of the um, things that we say in our statement referring to the pseudo, like we say, far from being socialist in any sense, they represent the interests of an upper middle class layer steeped in the divisive and regressive politics of identity based on race and ethnicity, sexuality and gender. One of the issues with identity politics is the fact that it is turned on and off like a faucet. This shows, firstly, that it is a manufactured and top-down movement utilised by the media um, at various stages. Um, if you remember, you know, with Me Too, it sort of waxed and waned um, depending on the immediate needs of those sections of the upper middle class. Um, it's not a grassroots movement aiming to defend victimised minorities. And again, uh, with the Me Too movement, you know, the plight of working class women um, you know, the exploitation and in the, in, uh, under capitalism was not an issue for those, for that movement. It was utilised particularly during the 2016 election by the Democrats to say that Hillary Clinton should be voted for 
as she was a woman who cared about different ethnic minorities. In fact, she had a more aggressive foreign policy than Trump at the time. And this is what is being played out now. Identity politics is also used to divert the masses from the key social questions of inequality and war. And just as a side note, um, I think it was in The Guardian today, there's an article how the, um, the teal independents who are um, uh, primarily um, upper middle class women are not representative of um, you know, uh, diverse identities. So you know, this, this is a discussion that takes place within the upper middle class and represents the um, you know, interests of certain selfish um, layers in the population. Okay. Um... Now, we, uh, we have a question also from Charlie. Uh, is Parliament corrupt or is it just the parties? Um, and so while uh, some of the candidates are considering the answer to that, I just want to draw your attention uh, to the, uh, the, the question of mirroring books and literature. Um, uh, now the first the first book that we we want to um, present to you is Quarter Century of War. This is a compilation of articles of uh, speeches and lectures presented by Comrade North, Comrade David North, who is the uh, chairman of the International Editorial Board of the World Socialist Website and of the uh, SEP in the United States. Now, obviously. It is now 30 years of war. Um, the, the, the entire development of, of war, uh, which ha has been identified, and we have identified particularly from 1990 to 1990, 1990 onwards, has now taken uh, further to, as, as Mike has out, outlined, a deepening and acceleration of the provocations and the perspective, which was developed very consciously with the dissolution of the Soviet Union at the dismemberment, the complete subjugation of Russia and China as the mechanism whereby the United States resolves, overcomes uh, its inherent crisis and the attempt to reassert its, its hegemony its economic hegemony, which has, has been lost by military uh, terms. Um, and if that is, is going to threaten nuclear war, well, then that is clearly something which the Biden administration, as well as NATO, uh, are willing to uh, risk and, uh, and proceed with. The book is $13 as an ebook or $30 as a hard copy book plus postage and handling. It is an extremely important uh, text to, to read uh, as part of your uh, Marxist library. And, and so I would urge you very much to, to purchase that. Um, our next uh, publication is The Russian Revolution and the Unfinished 20th Century. What that means, is that all the issues that were raised uh, by the, the, the 1917 revolution, the overthrow of capitalism in Russia by the working class, uh, which was enabled, which was made possible because of the leadership which existed within Russia in the form of the Bolshevik party. All the objective conditions existed on an international scale, whether it was Britain, uh, Germany in throughout Europe, World War I opened up all the, the uh, antagonisms, the contradictions, the crisis uh, which, uh, which was uh, underlying, which existed within capitalism, but it was only Russia that was able to carry through uh, the, the successful socialist revolution in, because of the existence of a revolutionary leadership. And so what the unfinished 20th century refers to is that all those questions, all those unresolved issues, uh, which were not able to be resolved in the form of the overthrow of capitalism, still exist. They still are there for resolution. And that is bound up with 
the, the necessary building and development and construction of a, of a revolutionary leadership. That, that publication is also $13 as an EPUB ebook uh, or $30 plus postage for a hard copy. And again, uh, I would recommend to all those listeners who and, and participants who don't yet have uh, those, uh, those publications to, uh, to purchase it. Um, look, very quickly, I know we're running out of, out of time, but the next two publications are the Australian Historical and International Foundations uh, uh, a book, as well as the um, American uh, uh, publication, uh, Historical and International Foundations. Uh, the Australian one is $15 plus postage and handling, and the American uh, uh, publication is $7 for a, uh, an ebook, and again, $15 plus postage and handling. Um, with those four uh, pieces of literature, you will be very much able to establish the really profound basis for the political perspective and program of the International Committee. Um, but I think, Jason, did you want to answer? Did you have your hand up or was that? I did. I was just going to add to what Peter was saying about identity politics, if you like. Okay. Yep, sure. Go right ahead. Look, I, I think one of the main points is the Democrats have been promoting this anti-Russian, um, they've been essentially the spearhead of the anti-Russia campaign for many years, and they needed in one way to distract people from this, you know, reactionary orientation. And, um, and you know, the Me Too movement and all that has gone hand in hand with that, with that, you know, general process. Um, it, much of it was done through the, you know, media outlets. I mean, New York Times is like a Democrat mouthpiece connected to the CIA. Uh, it's it's all it's always been an artificial, you know, orientation. As Peter said, it was not a grassroots movement, progressive movement. It has been done from the top down. Um, but largely, it was thrown out when, especially when Joe Biden was um, accused of certain things. It was dropped like a lead balloon. Like you know, it was just over at that point um not entirely you know there are still things going on but it lost a lot of the wind out of its sails later uh ronan farrow was accused of lying um and his career's almost been over we pointed that out um they tried to cover it up subsequently you don't hear much about it but th these sorts of things happen and then lastly the um population have kind of caught wind of its character like just lately the amber heard thing is a real expression of it um so with, when it comes to identity politics, there's different factors in it. But today, these layers, they were primed through this whole process, kind of self-professed morality and such. And now they're uh, backing the whole anti-Russia Ukraine campaign. Um, in, you know, many of the same characteristics are there, their own you know, sense of high morality and, and whatnot. Um, so that's where that whole milieu is now. You know, directed towards, and and it was a process of kind of organising them to, you know, this witch hunt. It was a witch hunt campaign that went on for years. Now they're doing it to Russian composers and such. It's there's no Chinese wall to these you know, processes. Anyway, I, I thought some of those points might be add to the discussion. Yeah, no, thanks. They do. Thank you. Uh, uh, there is a question from Charlie, uh, which uh, John will address on the question of parliament. Is, is it parliament that's corrupt or is it um, the parties, only the parties? Look, just, just in relationship to Charlie's question, uh, I think, okay, yeah, one can point to uh, all the different parties that exist in, 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 you know, capitalist parties that exist in parliament. And you can point to some form of corruption, some form of, um, you know, hypocrisy, uh, you know, which all of them, you know, which and members of them all have, uh, you know, committed. But it's it's more than just individual parties and uh, parties and, and the individuals within them. These parties in Parliament, whether it be uh, the Liberal Party, the National Party, the, the Labor Party, the Greens, um, you know, Australia Party, One Nation, all of them, uh, in one way or another, uh, they represent 
the interests of big business, the corporations, uh, finance capital, and they fight tooth and nail to, um, to carry through the demands uh, of uh, the ruling class. And in that sense, we, we have no illusions in the parliamentary system as a, you know, that change. If it was uh, Barack Obama uh, who once said that uh, the sort of divisions that existed between the Democrats and Republicans was an intramural scrimmage. In, in essence, they're on the same side, but there are there are divisions in, in or di disagreements on, on tactics, on policy. <clears throat> Essentially, this is the angle which all, all the parties through Parliament, it, it is a bourgeois institution. It is, a, it is an institution for the ruling class to pursue their, um, to pursue their interests and objectives. In, a, in essence, it's a, it is bound up. The, the question is, there is no socialist way forward through the parliamentary framework. And we campaign in elections to draw, to draw our attention to the working class, to our program and perspective, not because we have illusions in the capitalist system, but because we're, it, it is a time when people start think, when people think about politics. Uh, and it's also an opportunity for us to advance our program and perspective in the working class. But we've got no illusions in, in the parliamentary system itself. But essentially what we're calling for more than anything else is the independence of the working class from all capitalist organisations and parties. This is an absolutely essential question um, if the working class is going to, is, is going to fight for and, and advance their demands. Um, would it be a good opportunity? I, Cheryl, would it be okay if I, I know Erica has posted in the chat a question about rank and file committees. Is it okay if I answer that now or? Sure. And I think it, I think it actually uh, segues into, I think Erica's question is very good. Um, she asks, uh, let me just bring it up. Speakers have referred to rank and file committees. Uh, it would be good to flesh this out. How do we form them? What do, what do they do? How many people do you need to form one? What has been the experience of the SCP in, in their development? Um, I, think, I think it's a critical question on this issue because one, first of all, if someone wants to, to form a rank and file committee, uh, speak to us. We are more than willing to provide assistance, uh, leadership uh, in their formation. We have already assisted in the formation of rank and file committees among teachers, uh, postal workers, university workers, healthcare workers, uh, and that's just in, in this country. And you can point to uh, in countries around the world where we do have uh, uh, socialist equality parties. Uh, we've got uh, back rank and file factory committees with garment workers, agricultural workers, auto workers, manufacturing workers, railway workers, you know, and we're seeking to unify uh, these. Um, we're seeing to build more in uh, workplaces, uh, working class suburbs, factories all around the world. Now, in order to sort of become, be part of a rank and file committee, you don't have to necessarily be a uh, socialist or agree with absolutely everything that we say to join a rank and file committee or establish one. But what they will do, they will need to be used uh, by workers to actually share information amongst themselves to actually provide a platform to organize and discuss uh, what are the essential issues that they confront. Um, but an essential precondition uh, of rank and file committees is the necessity for the independence of the working class, uh, in particular from the existing trade union bureaucracy and every capitalist party and, and bourgeois organization. Uh, we encourage workers to form democratically elected committees in, uh, to, and to formulate and advance their fight for their own demands. And what's so important about this is that uh, I think um, what can be seen, for example, in Eric London's presentation, which was shown during Peter Byrne's report, uh, these organisations will be able to reach out to other sections of workers uh, to break the isolation uh, that is imposed by the unions. Uh, I think it's important to note, for example, uh, when there was a movement of workers at Volvo uh, last, uh, last year, 
we were in the United States, we were able to establish uh, a rank and file committee at the plant. Uh, workers at that plant were able to reach out to, to workers in other factories. And significantly, um, also uh, factory Volvo factory workers in, in Belgium uh, across the Atlantic uh, and call on their brothers and sisters across the Atlantic for assistance to, to do the same, to go on strike. Uh, and it was the intervention of the rank and file committees uh, and our party that was able to carry out such a campaign. Um, you know, it was, and we also drew it to the attention of workers at a Volvo factory in Queensland, uh, in Brisbane. And we got a very sympathetic, very, very uh, heartwarming response to that from workers. Um, I also recall uh, anecdotally, there was a nurse who we spoke to who was, who went in March this year, there was a strike by, by healthcare workers. She, uh, and we drew attention, her attention to um, a letter which was written by a nurse in California who was part of a health workers Frank and file committee. And, and she wrote in support of, of the struggles of nurses. And she, she almost broke down in tears of joy. She didn't realize that, you know, her, her struggles were being watched and, and, and being, you know, there was, there was worldwide support for them. And I think, it, I think that is an important role that rank and file committees can and will play. Um, <clears throat> you know, and that, that is one, this, this component is these committees will break the isolation of workers. Um, and will be a powerful tool in the unification of their struggles. And workers are striving to break free of the shackles which have been imposed upon them, most prominently uh, and by the existing trade union bureaucracy and, and apparatus. <clears throat> um, I think uh, Comrade Oscar char characterised in his report, unions are acting as a police force on behalf of the corporations. Um, uh, I think... Uh, one question that comes up sometimes is that can, can these rank and file committees be used to, to pressure the unions to the left to, to sort of uh, return them to actually fighting for conditions of workers. But I think this is, this is a sort of a dangerous illusion. It has to be recalled that the Australian unions working hand in hand with the Labor Party are responsible for the imposition of some of the most draconian anti-strike laws in the entire world. Um, in 2009, through the Fair Work Act, the unions and the then Labor government of Kevin Rudd made it virtually illegal for workers to go on strike outside of designated enterprise bargaining periods. And they have systematically traded off conditions across the board in sector after sector, industry after industry. Uh, tens of thousands of jobs have been destroyed. Now, one of the elementary demands that would be an essential component of the formation of a rank and file committee uh, would be the abolition of these anti-strike laws in, in this country and elsewhere. I think um, uh, it's, you know, the, I think Leon Trotsky once said in his, uh, in his book, The Transitional Program, uh, if a union no longer fights for workers' conditions uh, to, to increase pay, to win benefits for workers on the shop floor. You no longer have a workers' organisation, but you have an organisation of scabs, you know. The, and and the, these unions are entrenched in the corporations. I, I read recently that the uh, head of the um, uh, Australian heads of the Australian Education Union, I believe, have six-figure salaries at over $200,000. That money is provided to them because they have a job to do by the corporations to act as firemen in the class struggle. Anyway, I think, you know, it, it is absolutely, you know, I think, um, you know, it, such committees must be recreated today for the working class to advance their own demands, um, you know, and fight for their independence. Thanks, we'll John. Thank, thank you. Now that's, that's been helpful. Uh, the reason I'm pushing things along is we do have a couple more questions uh, but we do have to finish up. Um, and the, the question was the, uh, uh, there's one from Kerry on, so the question of, of democracy, does this, so, so this goes back to my question about whether the SEP believes in democratic socialism, and if not, what is the alternative model? Uh, then there is, um, uh, Vicky, again, sorry for my many questions, which you don't need to be sorry about. 
but I still lack clarity. Does the overthrow of the capitalist system mean abolishing small business? And so I think um, Mike is going to deal with them and we'll, we'll have to then uh, wrap up. Yeah, look, I'll need to be very brief, but parliamentary democracy is not democracy. It's a fig leaf. It's a facade for the rule of capital, for the rule of the capitalist class. You know, you could say, do workers get a vote or whether they get sacked or not? You know, you get a vote every three years for which uh, parliamentary agent is going to obey the laws of the financial markets. That's, that's all it is. We fight for genuine democracy between a workers' government. And there's a connection between that and the question of rank and file committees. We are fighting to develop organs of working class or democracy, workers' power within factories, within neighbourhoods, within schools and universities. And these will be the embryonic forms for a genuine uh, workers' government. Democracy is meaningless if you don't have control over the economy, over the production. Uh, and that's the essential question. The Marxist movement has always explained there is no parliamentary road to socialism. The parliament is a uh, is something which is capitalism developed in a certain period, but it it, it shields, camouflages the real nature of of power. And to be quite frank, if the parliamentary system can't contain, the, if the fuses start to blow, if it begins to break down, then the capitalist class dispenses with parliament. It carries out coups. It carries out regime change operations. We see that repeatedly, historically. The parliament is a, is a facade by, behind which the real power is held in the hands of the ruling financial and corporate elite. That's what has to be dispensed with. And that means a workers' government based on organs of working class power, that, like the Soviets in the 1917 October Revolution. Just on the other question of small business, no, socialism doesn't mean abolishing small business. It means, in fact, taking control of the levers of power, the banks, the finance, the finance houses, the, the, the huge corporations. As a matter of fact, that would actually enable, you know, small businesses to, to be much better off, you know, that it would be part of a transition, you know, to a completely different kind of economy. Uh, based based on production at all levels for, for social need, not for uh, not for private profit. But small business is being also you know oppressed by big business, and we, and we will certainly reach out. Uh, you know, socialist organisation of the economy will enable those layers of the population to actually be much better off than they are under uh, under the dictates of uh, finance capital. Uh, I'll just leave it there for you. Thanks, John. Uh, Mike, sorry, and John. Um, look, uh, uh, we, we will have to bring the, the discussion to a close. The, the questions have been excellent. I mean, really important questions. And nobody should apologise for uh, asking questions. You can't learn unless you ask questions. Um, but one of the other elements of learning is to fight to convince others. And that's why we want to appeal to you to assist in the last week of our election campaign with letterboxing, to put our election statements into people's letterboxes, uh, to campaign at pre-poll stations throughout the week, uh, to uh, come out on, on our campaigns and also on polling day. Uh, we have a, a form which uh, you can, uh, you can uh, uh, write into. My main parting message is that you really need to consider very seriously joining the Socialist Equality Party. One of the reasons that I went through the biography of our candidates and these are uh, young men and not so young um, from, from 
different walks of life, different experiences. They, they have, uh, they are ordinary people in many ways, but in that sense, they are also extraordinary people because they have responded to the vast changes and developments within the objective situation in different, possibly different uh, periods of time, different generations, but nevertheless, they have responded to the crisis of capitalism, the attacks which are being carried out against the, against the working class, the drive to war, the, the degradation of the, uh, the planet, the assault against the conditions and lives of the working class that are now becoming intolerable. Life for billions and billions of people throughout the world, including in this country, are becoming intolerable. Workers will fight, young people will fight. What they need is a, a leadership, a leadership with a perspective, with a political analysis, with an explanation as to why these events are taking place, but most importantly, what the perspective is to fight to overcome that. And I think as Mike and other candidates have outlined, that requires a revolutionary perspective, the overthrow of capitalism. It is only on that basis that war will be averted. While capitalism exists, the possibility, the threat and the probability of nuclear war is ever present. While capitalism exists, climate change will continue to destroy the planet and make life on earth in uninhabitable. While capitalism exists, the working class will be forced to pay for the price and the, and the crisis of this system. We call on you, if you agree with our perspective, if you want further discussion, join this movement. Uh, make an application uh, for, for membership and we will undertake to educate, train and uh, clarify you on these major historical events. But with those, those comments, again, I thank you very much for your uh, generous, very generous contribution. I thank you for your participation, your questions um, and your attention. And uh, please contact us ask for further discussion, ask for uh, applications to join and make the most Im important decision that you will make of your life and join this party. Thank you very much for your attention. Authorised by Cheryl Crisp for the Socialist Equality Party, Sydney.